Thank you. Uh, my name is Dave Ramirez. I am a senior software engineer with Inspire. Um, Inspire is by no means an audio technology company. Uh, in fact, we're actually working to bring clean energy to people's homes. So hopefully I get a few extra points on Jules's uh, Code That Matters score from this morning. Um, so I'm more of a full stack web developer, definitely not a professional audio developer. Um, as such, I've written lots and lots of JavaScript. And in classic JavaScript developer fashion, I'm going to talk to you about ways you can use JavaScript that might make your eyes bleed a little bit. Um, and so a little bit on the motivation of this talk, uh, I'm a hobbyist musician. Um, so when I was first introduced to the Web Audio API, <clears throat> um, I was really excited by all the cool things I could do making sounds with code. Um, and then I was also really interested in all the things that you couldn't do with Web Audio API and why that was. So I went on kind of like a year and a half long personal learning journey uh, into what joins um, JavaScript and audio. Um, this is kind of my reflection on that. So I'm going to go over some of the problems that you can often run into working with audio and JavaScript. Um, I'm going to go over kind of an oddball solution that I think is a lot of potential. And I'm going to show you off a, a very quick demo application that I put together that kind of illustrates that concept. And then we'll take a look at what makes that tick. Um, so JavaScript is definitely no longer just used for pushing web pixels around or uh, doing click callbacks in a website. Uh, I expect that it's probably used now for more things than anybody ever wanted it to or expected. Um, so with the rise of popularity of single page application frameworks like Angular and React, we're building full-fledged uh, front end applications with very rich user interactivity. Um, with Node.js, we're now building back end APIs and uh, server side applications, among many other things. Um, and now with GitHub's Electron framework, we can build um, browser-based applications as well in JavaScript. Um, so essentially, JavaScript has now become a virus. Uh, you can kind of try and escape it if you want, but it's best to embrace it. I know there's a few um, job hirings on the board outside. Might be nice to dip into that obnoxiously huge JavaScript hiring pool. Um, so I want to take a closer look at Electron specific, because that's the demo application I'm going to show you is an Electron application. Um, if you're not familiar with what Electron is, it's essentially a framework that GitHub develops that lets you bundle up web applications and distribute them as uh, desktop applications. Um, and the way this works is it actually bundles a lightweight build of Chromium alongside a Node.js runtime and gives you a few APIs as well to make it a little bit easier to work with some of the stuff around supporting multiple desktop platforms like uh, window management or file menu, stuff like that. Um, there are some pretty heavy critiques with the approach, mostly because you're essentially just distributing an entire web browser just to support one application, um, which is kind of crazy. But it's actually pretty effective for small dev shops or indie developers to use. Um, so you can target a ton of different platforms all at once with just a web-based code. Um, there's some pretty huge success stories with Electron. You can look at Slack, which a lot of you are probably using day to day. Um, Discord's application is an Electron app as is Visual Studio Code and uh, GitHub's Atom Editor, which was actually, Electron was actually built to support that initially. Um, fortunately for me, JavaScript can't do everything. Um, and I kind of want to talk about why you're probably not using it today to build a ton of audio applications. Um, for starters, it's definitely not as performant as lower level systems languages like C or C++. I don't expect that to be a surprise to anybody. Um, it's also single threaded. Uh, so there are some ways with various platforms to run code and background threads, like web workers for the browser. But generally, you're just running in a single thread. So all your uh, asynchronous behavior is done through something called the event loop. And without going too deep into how the event loop works, this is kind of an overly complicated diagram for this. But we can kind of think of it as a, just a queue for our asynchronous callbacks in our JavaScript application. So to go with an example of reading a file in Node.js, um, we're going to call the read file method, and our JavaScript is going to then continue on. We're not going to block and wait for that file to be read. Um, we're just going to keep going. And then when, once the file has actually been read, the event loop, or we're going to add an event to the, the queue in the event loop. Um, and then eventually, the event loop is going to pop that, uh, pop that event and execute our JavaScript callback. I say eventually, because that's not necessarily going to happen uh, immediately once our file is done reading. We might have to wait around a little bit for that to happen. Um, and this is problematic in the audio world for a couple of reasons. So first off, um, other code is going to have to wait around for us while we're doing things in our audio callback. So if we're processing audio for quite a while, 
um, the, you might see things like janky mouse movement and stuff like that, various UI issues. Um, really anything could get blocked up by us. But conversely, and probably more of a concern for audio, we also have to wait for other callbacks to do, to do their thing. So if something's taking a long time, like a, like a page redraw or something like that, <clears throat> um, we might be waiting for too long, drop buffers, have a bunch of sad ears. It's not a good idea. Um, quick fun fact, Node.js's implementation of the event loot is called libuv, and it has one of the coolest logos I've ever seen. Um, you may be thinking, duh. I know audio and JavaScript. I don't want to process JavaScript and audio. That's why I don't do it. Why does this guy still have a microphone? Um, and my less than exciting answer to that is kind of just don't use JavaScript to process audio itself. Um, and this is more or less the idea behind the Web Audio API. So our browser is going to render audio in a separate thread that's usually implemented in whatever lower level language the browser itself is implemented in. So for Google Chrome, this is uh, C++. Um, and then what get expo it gets exposed to the developers is a uh, pretty comprehensive API that you can use to build an audio graph. Um, and then all the actual sample processing is abstracted away from the JavaScript developer. So we're not editing those samples directly. Um, there are, the biggest limitation that I found with the Web Audio API is that we're limited to whatever node types that the graph provides. Um, there's definitely a lot of these, but as you develop more and more complex applications, you may run into something that we could either couldn't be done with the available node types or would be uh, overly complex and not worth doing. Um, if that happens, you have exactly three options. Uh, the first is use something called a script processor node. Um, so previous frame, I said we're not adding samples directly. That was actually a lie. That's exactly what this is doing. Um, but it has been deprecated for quite a while, and it also introduces significant latency just by adding it to your graph, even if you're not doing anything in the audio callback. So I don't recommend using this. Um, there's also the audio workload processor, which is kind of the answer to the script processor node. Um, again, we're, we're manipulating samples directly, but, and we're still operating within JavaScript, but we're not within the event loop anymore. We're executing this code on the rendering thread that all the other nodes are using to process their audio. Um, Biggest caveat here is that it doesn't technically exist yet. It's still, as far as I can tell, being spec'd out and implemented across browsers. So you have to wait a little bit. You're also still in JavaScript. So your code's not going to be quite as performant as it could be, which might not be an issue for a lot of use cases, but it also may. Um, and there's, you're still within the JavaScript ecosystem, so you can't take advantage of a lot of uh, open source tools and stuff like that. Uh, third option is just use something else entirely. Um, so if you're trying to develop something for the web, you're more or less restricted to the APIs that the web provides. Um, so this could be a problem. Uh, unfortunately for us, we're not limited to just the web anymore with JavaScript. So for the rest of this time, I'm just going to talk about uh, the use case of a specifically an Electron application. And the reason I'm doing this is because since Electron comes with a Node.js runtime, there's some cool stuff we can do around that. Um, and Node works. If you're, if you're not familiar with how Node works under the hood, it's essentially a port of V8's JavaScript engine that is used by Google Chrome. Um, and so it, it also has a collection of uh, APIs that you can use to do things that aren't normally available in a web browser, like file system access and some advanced network operations. And these work by wrapping up C++ APIs and then giving you JavaScript APIs to call into them. Um, the cool thing about this is that we can actually make these wrappers too which gives us uh, native C++ power. We're outside of the event loop. Um, and we can take advantage of the huge open source and uh, pre-existing library ecosystem with audio that exists in C++. Um, so I'm going to show you a quick demo application of this in practice. So let me get out of here. OK. So this is Schmix. Uh, Schmix is very humble. It can only do a few different things. Um, so for starters, we can open up a file. I'm going to get a drum track in here. Um, and we get something that kind of vaguely resembles a channel strip. Um, and we can do some things on here. We can mute the track. We could pan left and right and just gain. These are all things that you could very easily do with the Web Audio API. Uh, but it does have one kind of trick up its sleeve that's a little bit novel, and that you could add a VST3 plugin to it and use that. 
Um, so let me add a few more instruments in here. We'll get a guitar and a bass, and we'll groove along. You see our plugin is working in real time. So you can edit it with the EQ the same way you would in any other application. Um, the reason I chose VST plugins specifically, specifically for this use case um, is something that's definitely 100% impossible to do with Web Audio API itself. Um, it's also something that if you didn't have access to open source tools, it would require a fair bit of custom coding yourself. Um, and that's all that I'm going to show you this mix. So let me go back to the presentation. I'm just going to take a quick look at how this works under the hood. Um, so with this, all the audio processing is handled the same way as it would in the Web Audio API. All the samples are being rendered in a separate thread, completely outside of the event loop. Um, and in fact, the way that I implement this, implemented this was by creating a wrapper around an open source library called LabSound that is literally just a fork of uh, the Chrome's implementation of Web Audio API. So with a little bit of code, if we're willing to write these wrappers, we kind of have access to our own custom-built Web Audio API framework. Um, and then the only thing I really added on top of the Web Audio API was this concept of a plugin node. Um, so this node it inherits from the audio node base class the way any other node would. Um, the only thing it does in addition is to spin up this new plugin host process. And this process is literally just a Juice application using uh, Juice open source code. Um, so and Basically, we set up a shared block of memory between these two processes um, and use that to process our data. And even the shared memory and uh, uh, synchronization between the two processes was handled with Boost Inner Process. So I had to write very little custom C++ to get this done. Um, so even a web developer can do it. Um, so the rest of the time, I just want to show you some of the code and how you actually can build some of these add-ons yourself. Um, so I'm just going to start with a quick Hello World example. Um, so if you've not seen JavaScript before, or if you haven't dug too deep into Node.js, um, what we're doing is just uh, requiring this add-on module and then calling the hello method on it and printing out the result. And all this does is spit out the string hello world. Uh, so to look at the JavaScript implementation of this module, um, all we're going to do is define a function called hello. And all that function does is return the string hello world. Um, and then we just sign that to module.exports the hello property of that object. Um, and if you've never worked with Node.js before, this is essentially just setting up what gets uh, returned when you require this module, which in this case is an object with a property called hello that returns a function that we defined above. Um, so let's take a quick look at the C++ Im implementation of this module. So we're going to do the same thing, but with C++ code instead. Um, so we have this method here that we define called method, um, and it takes in this const nan function callback v8 value reference type argument called info. Um, it's kind of a bit of a mouthful, but what this represents is the context with which our uh, function is getting called from within JavaScript. So this has things in it like uh, the number of arguments that were passed to our add-on, um, what types those arguments were, were they strings or uh, numbers, and these are JavaScript types, not C++ types, so we have to handle the conversion and casting to and from uh, JavaScript and C++ types. Um, and it also is where we set the return value, what we want to return back to JavaScript when we're done. Um, so here we're just setting it to a new string that we've were created that has the value of world. Um, and it's kind of interesting to note here that we're not actually um, returning an, a value, a C++ type value. We're essentially creating a new JavaScript string uh, giving a value and returning that. Um, next bit is this init function. Um, and you can see it's taking a JavaScript object that has a familiar name called exports. Um, so what we're doing is setting a new 
uh, property on this object called hello and assigning it to the function that we created above. And this is functionally the same as just saying module.exports equals this. Um, so then there's also this node module macro here at the bottom. And this is the entry point for our add-on. And all it does here is just call our init function. Um, the last bit of code you need here is this binding.jip file. And this is how we define the build configuration for the add-on. So in this case, all we're doing is uh, giving it the path to this C++ file. That's our only source file. You can also define include directories. We need NAN, which is a collection of headers that node ships that makes it a little bit easier to work with all the different versions of Node.js. Um, there's a ton of different configuration that you can do here. It's pretty comprehensive, but um, this is a very basic example. And the last step is to take that binding.jip file and build our code with uh, a, an executable called node.jip that node also provides. Um, and what this spits out eventually is a .node file. Uh, and this is more or less a DLL that you can actually require from within JavaScript. And then use that as you would any other JavaScript module. Um, so you, you can kind of start to see how we're just really writing incredibly verbose JavaScript. And in fact, we're also actually just writing the bits that would happen behind the scenes of JavaScript that we wish existed. Um, it's kind of like writing Node.js with oven bits on. It takes a lot of code to do anything. You know in advance what you want to do, but it takes a lot of code. Uh, so there's lots of boilerplate. Uh, thankfully, and this is something that I really wish somebody had told me when I started looking at this stuff, there's a lot of tooling that makes this so much easier. Um, uh, one example of this is something called nbind. It makes it a lot easier to pass wrapped instances of C++ objects around. Um, it also abstracts away a lot of the type conversion for your method arguments and your return types. So here's, here's the example that I used uh, in the demo application I showed, where we use this nbind class macro, give it the class that we want to wrap, and then we define whatever methods on that class we want to be available in wrapped instances of that uh, class. Um, so here's the binding for audio node. Um, and the only reason I want to show you this so that I can show you the binding for gain node, which inherits some audio nodes. So we don't have to rebind all of these different methods for each different node type that we want to bind. Uh, the nbind will support inheritance. And you can also specify which constructors you want to be bound in this case where it's just going to take a float, which is the sample rate for our audio context. Um, and just real quick, I want to show you how we would consume this, um, this module in JavaScript. We're, here, we're just requiring the different bindings that we created. Um, we're going to make an audio context and a new sound buffer, which is, takes just the path to an audio file and the sample rate of the audio context, um, and then a new, create a new gain node. Then we're going to connect the gain node to the audio context. We're going to play that buffer on the gain node. And then we're going to set the gain value at 0.5 to reduce the gain. Um, and this looks very similar if you've ever seen web, web audio API code. It's pretty much exactly the same API. Um, and that's all I really want to go over. I want to thank everyone who put this conference together. Um, and thanks for listening. So the uh, Schmix application, as well as the uh, audio backend that I use to power the Schmixup uh, application is on my GitHub account if you want to take a look at the code. My username is RamirezD482. Um, and if you want to talk about anything on Twitter, I'm available. Um, or if you just want to tell me how bad my C++ is, that's cool too. Um, so yeah, if there's any questions, happy to take them. What about the real-time performances, uh, and especially stuff like garbage collector? Is it possible to tweak it uh, in order to you know, have better guarantees? So um, when we're talking about real-time performance in this context, uh, this is why it's really great that we're doing all the rendering not in JavaScript, where, where things are garbage collected. That's all happening in a completely separate thread in C++. So there's definitely a lot more resources being used in the JavaScript side of things, but that should hopefully be shielded off from actual the rendering in terms of uh, things happening in real time. Um, 
I have a quick question, sure. if I may. So um, I, I, I really found it very interesting that you, that you actually run the audio processing in a completely separate process. Um, what, is there any reason why you put it into a separate process and not into a separate thread? Just? Yeah, there is. Um, so in general, there's not a good way to show the audio plugins GUI within the context of the event loop. Um, GUI things in general you want to do not in the same process. Um, so with Juice's uh, GUI stuff that needs to run on a separate process, um, it has to do more with like what's taking up the main thread, and and it doesn't work very well, at least with uh, Coco, for uh, not being on the main thread. Any other questions? Going once, going twice. Okay, then let's join me uh, in thanking the speaker again. Thank you.